Hey there, this is Pat Ennis of Ennis Legacy Partners. Welcome to the Exit Readiness Podcast. I'm here with co-host Walter Dial, CPA and tax partner at GRF CPAs and Advisors in Bethesda, Maryland. Our mission here on the Exit Readiness Podcast is to provide you, the business owner, with subject matter expertise on topics pertaining to business uh, building, sellable or transferable business value, and for planning your eventual exit from the business. We want to help you build a business that's sellable and then exit successfully on your own terms and conditions. If you build sellable or transferable business value, you will have more options for exit. That's an oft-repeated exhortation during these podcast conversations. If you've tuned in at all in the past, you've heard us say, something along those lines. I, our clients, the clients that work with us, they want to get value out of their businesses when they leave. And so they're intent on building and accelerating the drivers of business value, such as financial performance, uh, a next level management team, strong systems, processes, uh, differentiated products and services. Well, as important as it is to build and accelerate the the value, it's also that as important to protect the current and future value of the business. And that's what we're going to focus on today, protecting the value of the business. And um, so our topic today is protecting value with risk management and controls. And our guest is Mac Lillard, who has been with us before. Max is Senior Manager of Risk and Advisory Services with GRF CPAs and Advisors. So he's a peer or a colleague of, of Walters. Uh, Mac and his team, they help clients build and maintain risk management processes, optimize systems through integration and automation, enhance controls for fraud prevention uh, and detection, and enhance uh, cybersecurity capabilities. And uh, again, Mac's been with us before, so we're happy to have him back. Mac, welcome back. Welcome back, Mac. Thank you both for having me. Excited to be here. Mac, great to see you. Um, you know, I think one of the biases Pat and I kind of bring to the whole exit planning platform is we're, we're both financial guys. And we tend to look at, and me, me especially, tend, I tend to look more at numbers than I do the kind of the qualitative nature of the business itself. So one of the reasons we love having you on here is because that's your focus. You're not so much the numbers guy. You're looking at what's going on with systems and how businesses are mitigating various risk factors. So why don't we start our conversation with that today? You know, I'm, I'm always thinking, you know, cash flow is a risk, things like that. But there, you know, businesses are faced with tons of risk. So, can you just start off by uh, highlighting a few of what I would call like the non-number risks? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, first and foremost, I think as far as just like a non-financial factor risk is just having a process for identifying, assessing, managing, and monitoring your risks on an ongoing basis, and then some of the other kind of non-financial factors are the considerations around fraud, around cybersecurity, um, around business transformation, autom automation, things like that. And then also your third parties. Um, and these also do have tie-ins to obviously your financial performance and everything, um, but these can sometimes be overlooked. Um, and this is probably oversimplifying things, but you know, as, in terms of what drives a, a business value, I typically do kind of look at it in two different um, perspectives, I guess, first and foremost, kind of what you just alluded to, um, obviously the financial performance, increasing revenue and decreasing expenses, increasing your profit margins is ultimately going to improve your valuation. Um, but then there's another way to kind of improve the the overall valuation that maybe your your listeners aren't as familiar with, and that's um, changing the, the capitalization and discount rates that are applied in the valuation. And that's something that, again, uh, um, you know, a business owner may not be as accustomed to, um, but as valuation analysts or financial advisors, you know, we need to consider all those things. And 
what that really revolves around is, you know, all of the different rates that go into performing evaluation. So there are certain rates like your risk-free rate, your equity risk premium, beta adjustments, all these other complex adjustments that are typically pulled from resources like the Kroll Cost of Capital Navigator. Um, and those are standard. Those are going to be used by most valuation analysts in their in performing their engagements. But then there's also a few other metrics like the size premium, a company specific risk premium and an industry specific risk premium that can be a little bit more subjective. And I think that's where these non-financial factors tie into. Um, but ultimately, those those discount capitalization rates can really uh, make or break evaluation depending on the valuation analyst and their assessment of some of those non-financial factors. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point because, you know, you'll hear someone say, well, you know, my my friend has a company just like mine and he just sold for five times revenue. You know, because when you use a, a multiple is, a, is another way to state a discount rate, basically. So, you know, they'll go, well, so my company's worth five times revenue. Well, you know, company A and company B can have a million differences. What if company, what if this guy's company just suffered a major cyber, a major cyber attack and has lost all credibility in the, in the marketplace, you know, something like that. So it, you know, I think our listeners need to keep in mind that, and it is very simple just to look at your discount rate as a multiple, but like anything else in the valuation world, there's a range of multiples. You know, there's what we would call kind of like, um, you know, the, the very top companies, a lot, a lot of times in a smaller, mid, mid-sized company, multiples will, will kind of fall in a range of between three, maybe three to five times EBITDA, something like that. But there's a big difference between the companies that are getting the five times and the company that's getting the three times. And that's what you're saying. It's all these other factors that, that drive that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, again, just having a, a process or a system in place to manage and monitor any of those risks. Obviously, you want to incorporate the financial factors as well, but also incorporating the non-financial factors like your management structure, human capital, cybersecurity protocol, fraud forensic risks based on your size and the industry that you operate in. Um, yeah, depending on the valuation analysts and kind of what they consider and how they weight things, yeah, that can have a have a pretty profound impact on yeah making a a five times multiplier or falling into that three times multiplier range. Yeah, and if we're looking at, you know, one of the things that's really coming up nowadays um, are internet scams and fraud things like that. What what are the best practices in that area now? Because I know that's an area that they, uh, that you really concentrate in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think you, you you kind of touched on a couple of different things there. Just first and foremost, just having a a general anti fraud program that's really going to focus on trying to protect the organization from internal and external fraud. Um, so having like a defined process in place. That's going to help to improve the reliability of your financial information, and it also provides confidence to any outside parties that the organization obviously has a strong tone at the top, a zero tolerance policy against fraud, um, fraudulent activity. So, by if you're able to prevent fraud before it takes place, you're ultimately protecting your bottom line, focusing on those financial factors by not taking any kind of fraud losses. You're also going to improve or at least maintain your reputation, like you just touched on, maintaining you know that that credibility within your industry or to your client base by not having to report on any kind of fraud. And ultimately you, you protect investor confidence. So this helps to improve both kind of the financial and non-financial factors. Um, so just kind of drilling down into, you know, specific fraud concerns is um, again, having that uh, defined policy process in place, having a whistleblower policy, as well as uh, making it easily accessible for anybody inside or outside of the organization to report, having a, a link to a form that you can fill out online to communicate any kind of suspicious or unusual activity, doing your anti-fraud training. Um, you know, we, we always recommend at least once a year, the more often you can do that, the better. Uh, again, just helps to 
increase that tone at the top, strengthen that, and then just uh, communicate that zero tolerance policy. But you had also mentioned specifically like online scams and phishing. That is how most organizations fall victim to fraud nowadays is through some sort of digital means. Um, so making sure that your employees are going through the appropriate training, doing those kind of phishing simulations or exercises to actually test employees. Um, you know, those are one of the most cost effective and just overall effective controls. There, there's tons of providers out there from No Before, Mimecast, Barracuda, who are all getting involved in these kind of phishing trainings or phishing exercises. Um, and, you know, statistics from the ACFE or the IAA will show that those types of trainings have one of the biggest impacts on actually preventing these from occurring. So in terms of stopping kind of online scams, ransomware, phishing scams and things like that, um, training the end user is going to be the, the best bang for your buck. Yeah, you know, I was with the, I was at lunch at Mac last, last week with a business owner and, and the business owner was telling us about how this past year, one of the surprise hits she had was uh, a $30,000 fishing expedition um, and basically what happened was the bad actor hacked into the system and created an invoice that looked like, smelled like you know, all other invoices for this particular vendor. <clears throat> and I think it was more than one, that, but it, the total was $30,000. And, uh, and she said it was just extremely well done to where it looked just like and it, and and they found out when they when the um the vendor contacted them and said hey when are you going to pay this bill yeah. and they said well we have paid and they said well no you have and that's when she with more due diligence she found out that she had been and so is that the kind of thing you're talking about here yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, unfortunately, with the evolution of AI and chat GPT, those phishing scams and those emails are getting harder and harder to detect. You know, it used to be, say, even three years ago, you'd get one of those and there it would be kind of riddled with typos or just things that really stick out um, that would give you pause for concern and then you would follow up. But now with chat GPT, everything can be formatted, grammatically correct. It can be done very professionally. And so that initial... Um, contact is much harder to detect. And to your point, Pat, you know, when somebody gains access to a system, they're not typically going to get access and, you know, proceed with trying to exfiltrate funds that day. They're going to live in your system for weeks, months at a time. They're going to understand who you do business with regularly, who you're communicating with on a, on a recurring basis. They're going to, if possible, maybe even pull down actual invoices from the system, like you mentioned, um, you know, the fact that the invoice they used looked just like a normal invoice. They probably had access to the template, you know, with an Adobe PDF, you can make, just edit that to change small data points, numbers, amounts, bank information, and things like that. Um, so again, when they ultimately do decide to act, they're leveraging um, somebody that you do business with on a regular basis. They're leveraging maybe even existing email threads. So it's not uh, the start of a new conversation. And then they're using actual templates or invoices that have been used in the regular course of business. So it looks familiar. It seems familiar coming from somebody familiar. Um, and again, just doesn't sound any of the alarm bells. Yeah. So of everything that we talk about here uh, during this conversation, this might get the attention of owners before anything else, because I think it is, well, it is, it's happening more and more frequently and it's, it's tough to detect. You mentioned training as, as a step to take, um, to guard against this it, training. And then what, what else, uh, in addition to training? Yeah. So I think, you know, just kind of building on the examples we just talked about is, is just third party risk management, uh, and this would really fall under your company-wide enterprise risk management process, but making sure that you're doing everything you can to manage and monitor risks associated with your outside providers. Um, you know, if we look back at some of the, the more prolific hacks that have occurred recently, or even just outages, you know, the target breach was a result of an HVAC vendor who had access to the system. The Pentagon was breached, I think, 
five, six years ago as a result of a travel agent who handles, you know, I think it was maybe like 3% of the travel arrangements for the Pentagon. Um, and then recently, even the, the Microsoft outage that happened a couple of weeks ago wasn't the result of Microsoft. That was the result of CrowdStrike pushing out a patch that hadn't been properly vetted, caused a, a nationwide or worldwide outage. Um, so making sure that you're constantly reviewing these these types of outside parties that have access to your systems, your data, or that you just rely on in any kind of critical capacity, whether it's cybersecurity or whether it's within your supply chain, your operations, uh, making sure that you have a, a process in place to manage and monitor them. So a lot of organizations, they have like procurement, they have vetting, you know, before they engage with somebody, they do all this due diligence and background checks. And then maybe once they're engaged, um, then, then the monitoring or the evaluation kind of stops at that point. So what we recommend uh, is that all of our clients essentially quantify the risk or assign a risk ranking to any of their vendors, somebody who you don't share data with, who you're not critically or, or significantly relying upon for your operations, they're going to fall into your low risk and they could be subject to just, you know, your normal vetting procedures. Somebody in that medium risk area might be subject to more stringent vetting procedures. Maybe you do an annual review, whereas any of your vendors who are high risk, and it's likely only going to be five to 10% of your vendors, those who store data, manage data, implement cybersecurity controls, um, have access to operational, financial, intellectual property, anything like that. Those are the uh, types of vendors that you're going to want to do more regular assessments over. So maybe on a quarterly basis, you're going through and um, making sure that there are no kind of issues communicated regarding the vendor, making sure that you're reviewing any of the access rights to the systems that they have control over, making sure that they're not making any kind of unusual changes or you know, verifying that they don't have more access than they need to. Also reviewing anything it is that they're doing on behalf of the organization, whether that's pushing out patches to the security system, uh, preparing reports, emailing with customers, donors, funders, just doing a review of that to make sure, again, there's nothing that gives you pause for concern or anything that you may wish to correct through, you know, adding new language to the contract, just having a conversation with the vendor to make sure that you're both on the same page, or, you know, in the, in the worst case scenario would actually make you reevaluate whether or not you engage with them further and maybe go out to bid for whatever service uh, it is that they're providing to you. Yeah, so in, in two questions, two follow-up questions. Um, you just mentioned a, a potentially a quarterly review of, of vendor relationships from a cyber security perspective. <clears throat> uh, first question is, in regard to all these other audits and, and internal controls, what's the frequency? Um, and forgive me if I sound uninitiated in all this because I, I, I am. <laughs> Uh, the is it daily? Is it around the clock? Is it every uh, twenty four hours? Is it every week? Every month? That's first question. And then the second question is: How can our listeners know if their IT um, vendor has these capabilities? Um, because most of our clients, the owners, the founders of these businesses sound like me when it comes to, or maybe not as bad as me, but as uninitiated as, and, and uneducated in these areas as I am. So how can you help them in regard to how frequent uh, audits uh, should be happening? And then two, how can they know if their IT provider has these kind of capabilities? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll start kind of with the first one, just around the the frequency of controls. Um, and that one is going to be kind of dependent on what the control is. So as part of just a an enterprise risk management program, um, anybody who's subject to, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley requirements is going to be familiar with this. But for all your control areas, essentially you assign a risk ranking to it. So whether it's a high risk control, something that's going to um, prevent fraud from occurring versus a low risk control um, that is really just for the purpose of processing information and making sure that it um, you know, gets to, to the appropriate places. You'll assign a risk ranking to each of these control mechanisms. And based on that risk ranking, that will kind of determine how often you evaluate those. So certain processes, maybe they get touched on annually or biannually, whereas certain other processes like cybersecurity, 
cybersecurity in today's operating environment is something that we call it, it falls under continuous auditing. Um, and that's where your third parties come into play, like a like a CrowdStrike that worked with Microsoft. You know, they are continuously monitoring and scanning for vulnerabilities or unauthorized access or open endpoints um, to just reduce any kind of vulnerability on an ongoing basis. Uh, and again, that's because cybersecurity for any company right now is is a high risk area that so we do recommend trying to do some sort of continuous monitoring um, through some sort of assessment or typically leveraging a third party provider. And how you can know, you know, that you're engaging somebody who's a qualified provider is it really just comes down to due diligence, um, making sure that, again, you have a defined process for vetting all of these providers, doing your online research um, to assess any of these, these providers' capabilities. There's all sorts of different tools you can use out there for applications. There's G2, um, Trust Radius. Captera software advice is like an online platform that's used for just getting a, an actual user reviews. So there's, there's lots of different tools that you can use out there to vet the security requirements or just the user, um, user satisfaction of some of these tools that I would recommend incorporating into the due diligence process. And then any other qualified vendor is typically going to have their security protocols published in some form online, whether they undergo annual penetration testing or they're ISO certified or NIST compliant. This is something that it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of energy and resources to, to maintain that compliance. So for most providers, it's going to be something that they're proud of. They, they put it online and they show, they, they put that out there to set them apart. Um, so if you're ever engaging a vendor that doesn't have any information like that published online or doesn't have any kind of SOC report or anything like that available, that to me would, would be a bad sign. Hey, Mac, I know one of the things, I think we have a GRF because, you know, you could have a situation where you've got somebody, you know, oftentimes people who have been with the company a long time are in the best position to perpetrate these things within the company. You know, it may be that a subordinate is being told to do certain things and he, you know, what's he, he's in a, very awkward position as far as number one, he may not know for sure if what he's being told to do is there's something wrong with it. Um, and he also may be, you know, afraid of his boss or whatever. Don't we have something set up at GRF where it's like a hotline or something like that, a confidential hotline? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is that um, like a standard, is that a recommended standard procedure? Yes, yes, for sure. Um, so that would be part of like the the anti-fraud program I alluded to, and that would be specific to sort of your whistleblower directive. Um, so, you know, a lot of times, a lot of organizations, particularly smaller organizations, like you mentioned, with very tenured employees who have been there a long time, you know, their whistleblower policy might be see something, say something. If you see something, report it to your, your direct supervisor. If you feel that they're involved in any capacity or you're not comfortable, go to the person above them or or go to the board. Um, but unfortunately, you know, those mechanisms aren't very effective because just like you said, Walter, um, sometimes people are are concerned that maybe this is going to get back to the person they're reporting to. It's going to negatively impact them. There's also just the overall concern that maybe I don't have all the information. Maybe I'm wrong about this and I'm going to be accusing, you know, my very tenured boss of doing right. something that they're not actually doing. So there's, yeah, there's lots of reasons that would, um, drive somebody in the opposite direction of reporting. So having some kind of hotline or email is, is best practice. Hotlines are a little bit more effective because of the anonymity, um, even though you can, I guess, technically trace a, a phone call. But what we're seeing a rise in is online platforms that help to manage this. Um, and the one that we work with at Whistleblower or at, at GRF is called, uh, it's just Whistleblower Software by a company called Formalize. Um, and the reason these are increasing in popularity is one, just because it, it streamlines everything. It's all of it is on a cloud-based platform. Um, so as somebody reports something, it's immediately pushed out to those who have access to review it, um, typically two people. So that one person isn't in charge. Ultimately, if somebody were to report something about that person, if they were the only one reviewing it, they could just clear it from the system, right? So right. it gets automatically pushed out to, to two or three people in charge of it. You can manage the case from end to end. You can actually communicate with the whistleblower themselves. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that it actually um, promises legitimate anonymity. 
in which somebody doesn't have to submit their name or anything like that. And you can still continue to communicate with this anonymous person. It scrubs all of the metadata or the information related to like the IP address or the location of the individual. So even if the system were to be breached, um, all of this data would be gone. So it would be near impossible to still identify uh, whoever it is that submits that complaint. So yeah, it just provides a little bit of peace of mind to the person who's actually submitting. But yeah, these platforms are great because it allows you to kind of decentralize everything. If you're an international organization, you can set this up based on individual office. If you're just a large organization, you can set it up by department, or you can just set it up all under one thing in which it's every every complaint, every allegation is um, feeding through directly to your legal counsel. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility in how you set it up, who has access to it. You could even set up somebody, like our clients will set up GRF as an advisor. So we'll help a client implement, get it all set up, um, and then maybe turn it over to them so that they can take charge, but they'll allow us to stay in the system as an advisor. So if an allegation comes in, we don't actually see the allegation, but if they need our help and say doing a forensic analysis over some financial activity, then they can assign the case to us. We now have access to that single instance. We have access to all the documentation that's been provided, all of the information. Um, so it just makes for a really seamless and streamlined process for actually following up on any of the allegations that are received through it too. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, so hey, Mac, this has been fantastic uh, per usual. Uh, great content. I think it's going to be very helpful to the listeners. And, and in a second, I'm going to wrap this up and I'm going to ask you one of the questions I'm going to ask is if, if there's anything that you'd like to promote today. Uh, but before we get there, is there, if there's uh, listeners out there who have an IT provider, and they just would like maybe a second opinion. Maybe they, they're listening to this and they're just having questions. Oh my gosh, I don't know if our, our vendor is capable in these areas. Do you, at GRF, do you have some kind of um, second opinion, like um, assessment or something that you can do to help them understand where, where they might have gaps? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, we we typically, if that's a concern for a client, we'll kind of come in and do our own baseline IT assessment to see if there are any gaps that maybe the provider, um, based on their service level agreement, should be mitigating or should be addressing. Um, we can also do a, you know, if they're working on a particular framework, um, or even if they don't have a defined framework, we can benchmark them against a relevant framework like NIST or CIS um, or ISO, just to see how they are, um, you know, matching up against one of the the best practice frameworks. So those are all tools that we can use to yeah, assess the overall provider. But then, you know, for the client, if obviously budget is a concern and you, they don't have the money to expend on that again, the the online resources I mentioned, like G two Trust Radius, Captera Software Advice, they have a lot of really good information on other users' actual experiences with those vendors. Um, and those can be really helpful for, you know, identifying people who have had negative experiences where they've identified gaps. Um, it can help you do that for, for free as opposed to having to engage. But yeah, that's, that is something that a lot of our clients do approach us with, particularly as part of their third party risk management program. They want to get another third party outside of the IT vendor to sign off and say that, you know, it, it does appear that they're doing a good job. There's some small areas for improvement, but overall there's there are no significant gaps that we can that we've identified that again we give us pause for concern as to whether or not you continue to engage them. Or there's the opposite. We identified a huge red flag that any qualified IT vendor should have mitigated. You know, this this may give you reason to to go out for bid or maybe source quotes from other potential providers. All right, fantastic. Uh, what uh, is there anything else you'd like to promote today, Mac? And then too, if you'd if you want to provide your contact information, please do that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, anybody can find me on LinkedIn, just under my name, Mac Lillard. It's a relatively unique name, so I think I come up pretty easily. Um, and then you can also visit the GRF website. You can find me under our fraud and forensic resources page or our risk advisory services page. 
Um, as far as things to promote, you know, Melissa Musser and I, we're actually working on an article right now that's going to kind of expand on some of the areas we talked about over risk management and controls and just talk about other mechanisms to just help drive value. That's going to be released in the next two to three weeks. Uh, so definitely would just recommend everybody keep an eye out for that. That'll be posted on the GRF website, and I'll also publish that on my LinkedIn. Um, and then we have a, a few other articles kind of just coming out each on a, on a monthly basis about yeah, just how to drive value, um, improve the value of your organization, improve upon your risk management controls with a focus on fraud, cybersecurity, third-party risk management. Uh, but again, that'll all be posted on the GRF website and my uh, individual LinkedIn page. Great. Thank you, Mac. Uh, and listeners, uh, please, uh, if you have any question about any of this, please consider reaching out to Mac or taking advantage of the free resources that he mentioned at the, those different sites. Uh, we're seeing more and more of this. And of course, it, it's going to impact your value in regard to your exit. You do not want this to happen to you. What happened to the business owner that I had lunch with last week, you just don't want that to happen. For her, it was $30,000. For you, it could be you know, much more than that. So you want to just take steps to mitigate that risk and, and to minimize it and we can't encourage you enough to reach out to Mac or take advantage of some of these resources that he mentioned. And if you want help in maximizing the value of your business or planning for your eventual exit, you can reach Walter at 301-951-9090. You can reach me at 301-859-0860. You can also access resources at grfcpa.com and exitreadiness.com. Thank you for listening. And if you've benefited today, please consider subscribing, liking, and then sharing this, uh, this episode on social media. Until next time on the Exit Readiness Podcast, this is Pat Ennis and Walter Dial signing off.